Father, what we call, just as by way of review, the larger catechism, the shorter catechism, and the Westminster Confession of Faith collectively. It's a Westminster standard. That's right. So if you want to refer to all three in one another, just say Westminster standards. Okay? Uh, another question we asked, how did the Westminster Confession of Faith come about? Uh, confession of Faith don't just drop from the sky. Someone's about to write these things. And what was the short answer we gave last week for how it kind of came about? The historical uh, circumstances. You want to remember? It was ordered by Parliament. 120 theologians met. That's right. In England, it came out of England in 1647 in the Westminster Assembly, uh, by the Westminster Assembly in Westminster Abbey, by 120 Westminster divines or theologians uh, in London, England. Okay, another question. How is the, how's the Westminster Confession of Faith organized? How does this confession break down? What's the structure or the uh, the layout, if you will? Confession, Which is just a confession. About just a confession. Thirty-three chapters on every subject in the Bible. There are thirty-three chapters that make up the confession of faith, um, and we talk through some of these these chapters. Um, Anyone remember some of these chapters? Have we covered the idea? I can't think. The chapters of the Westminster Confession. What's that? I just want to say, I'm not sure. Yeah, so there are 33 chapters which make up the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, anything on the doctrine of Scripture, from human free will to the providence of God to assurance of salvation to the return of Christ, to uh, the final judgment. All these, all these issues and doctrines are discussed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, and then lastly, we discussed last week, I gave you 12 or 13 or so reasons as to why we should study this confession. Uh, why embark on a um, several-month-long expedition of the Westminster Confession of Faith and I won't reverse all those reasons, but let me just, let me just summarize a few of the reasons we, we gave. Uh, one reason we said is because the confession really is a summary of the Bible. It really does summarize God's word for us. Uh, we also said it's important to know what you believe and why you, why you believe it. And the confession uh, helps us with that. Another reason is it's your theology. Um, so you should know your very own theology. Uh, another reason God cares about the Christian mind. God cares about how we develop our, our mind. We said to rebut doctrinal error. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith helps us to know orthodox, uh, orthodox thinking. And so we can, in knowing that, we can be able to refuse uh, doctrinal error. Um, another reason we must pass these truths on to our, our children um, is our responsibility as the adults to pass on, to catechize, if you will, our own theology to our, to our children. And we're doing a great job, by the way, of that. And Children's Church, I mean, he's doing that with the children's catechism. Um, but it's, it's, it's our theology to pass on to the next generation. Um, and lastly, or another reason I gave last week is there's much devotional value in knowing the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's, it is deep theology. Don't, don't misunderstand. It is really deep theology. But it's also relevant to your uh, life. All these great statements about who God is, what He's done, uh, justification by faith alone, assurance of salvation, good works, the return of Christ, and so on and so forth. And I think last week I ended by saying how we're going to study this huge confession of faith. It's about 25 pages, I think, or so on, on the Microsoft Word paper. So it's, that's a pretty lengthy confession. The Nicene Creed, as we confess every other week, and the Apostles' Creed are about this long. But the Westminster Confession is probably like quite really ten times that size. We're going to go chapter by chapter. I think there's so much theology packed into each chapter, we're going to go one at a time. And I've drawn up a study guide for you, and we're going to go through questions. So it'll be question and answer based. So I need you to uh, help me uh, in participation. 
And um, they were to look at chapter one of the confession. What better place to start than the very first chapter? And as you see on your outline, we'll try to go, we'll try to go about in this way. Um, we'll go one paragraph at a time. And my plan is that we need to you know, revise a long way. We'll do that. But my plan is for us to read one paragraph and then ask the questions that correspond to that paragraph. And you can bring other questions that I didn't raise here in your in your study. You can ask more than you, you have. But let's look at the Western Confession of Faith, chapter one, paragraph one. You'll have to go to your Trinity hymnal in the back of your Trinity hymnal, or if you have your own Confession of Faith, uh, the Red Trinity hymnal. I'll read the page number. 847, okay. 847 in the Trinity Hymnal. And actually, we're only going to do half of this first chapter today because it's quite dense. So we'll do chapter 1, paragraph 1, to chapter 1, paragraph 5, if that makes sense. All right, so let's read that first paragraph. Chapter 1 of the Holy Scripture. So we're starting with what the confession says about the Bible. It says, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry, sundry times and in diverse manners, I love that old English, sundry times and diverse manners, to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church. And afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing which make the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. Then it says, those former ways of God revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. Alright, that's the first paragraph there. 1.1. Let's go through some of these questions. You can raise questions that you have as well. Um, I tried, by the way, to in italics to give you kind of a summary of what that paragraph is talking about. Or part of it. So, General relation, but the italics were conscience, creation, and providence. What are the three questions? What are the three forms of general revelation uh, mentioned in the opening line of the confession? That opening line. By nature. Yeah, it lists the, the light of nature. Well, what is the light of nature, by the way? I'm not going to pick on anyone, but Mark, what's the light of nature? Mm-hmm. Not just from nature itself. Well, actually, definitely. I was a good course of creation, but uh, I don't know. Background on that. I could just be the stars, and possibly then. Because of course of creation, I was going to say everything got created, but that's the next piece of course of creation, so I can't include that. Uh, actually, in its original, uh, I think it's an original. When they were drawing this confession, a light of nature refers to um, what Calvin called a sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine that everyone has in them. Now, all people know God in their conscience. In their conscience. So our conscience is a uh, it's general revelation that we know basic morality, right and wrong. Okay, creation is another one. We know God through general revelation from creation. I preached a psalm on, or a sermon on Psalm 19 not long ago. Psalm 19 tells us that uh, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. They, they claim his, his existence to us. And then providence. What's providence? The opening line says, the light of nature, the works of creation, and providence tell us that there is a God. What is providence? So the robot. What did you say? Remember, we, when we went to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I don't think I was here for that, but 
When you went through it, but before I got here, one of the questions is, what are God's works of providence? And basically the answer is, what's that? Is God working for everything? Yeah. Yeah, this world... Yeah, yeah, yeah this world doesn't just um, run itself. Right? Someone has to run it, and that's God. God's the one who tells the moon and the stars and the wind and the rain where to go and how to happen. And that is, um, that's one aspect of general revelation. Okay, number two, what is general revelation? What is general revelation? What does it declare? This says to support your answer with Scripture. Romans 1. Yeah, what is what is general revelation? What you can say. What you can see is created as a creature. Yeah. You can you can determine there definitely is God through what's been created. That's right. That's right. Through conscience, through creation, through providence. Those three things make up general revelation. And what does general revelation declare? It tells all people everywhere, whether you're in Jacksonville, whether you're in China, all people everywhere know that there is a supreme God. Everyone has a conscience. Everyone can see creation. Everyone uh, knows his providence. Well, support your answer with Scripture. Where, where would you go, Mark? You mentioned one to support this idea of general revelation. Romans 1, 18 through 20. Do you have that handy by chance? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So that's knowing that light of nature we're talking about, that we all then suppress it. Uh, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that men are without excuse. For all of them, for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God would give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were dark and plainly wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Yeah, Romans 1 is the key passage to go to for general revelation. Paul says that God, what we know about God's plan. Why? Because He revealed it to us in the works of creation. And mankind uh, suppresses that truth, unfortunately. Even though all people know that there is a God, they, they want to keep that knowledge down. But all people do know that there is a God. Now that knowledge of God doesn't save us. We'll, we'll come to our, we'll say that in question three. But all people do know God is. Um, still one question too. How could this idea of general revelation direct our evangelism and our defense of faith? No one in question. You mean like when we speak to people and evangelize them? Is that what this yeah, is? Yeah, which is the point? Because obviously depending on faith, I mean you can basically tell people there's no they have no excuse. Yeah, that's right. Just as Mark just read, I mean, people are are inexcusable for their for their unbelief. There's yeah. I'm sure you can even tell what like, you know is a God, but you're choosing to suppress the truth. You know, just as scripture says. And it says it. You just don't want to acknowledge it because you don't want to change your ways. Yeah. That's right. And what was the answer? Uh, number two? Yes, the last part. How does how does it direct our attention? Well, that people uh, suppress the truth about God because of, of human sin. Um, something along those lines. And, you know, you could say things like, uh, you, know, you know that there's a God. How about your conscience? How about who made the created order? Number three, uh, why does 1.1 say that general revelation is not sufficient? Where's that at? about the third line down, not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will, which is necessary to salvation. Why would the confession of faith give that line, or that disclaimer? Well, I have a different copy of the confession of faith, but um, it's about three or four lines down. After, the, after it says it leaves men excusable, and it says general revelation is not sufficient to give knowledge of God and His will, which is necessary for salvation. 
general revelation does not give you uh, that God elected people, that He sent His Son to die as uh, the atonement for our sins, and that the Holy Spirit came to bring us into line with God's salvation. General revelation is general. It's just general truth about about God. This is what you want to say. Well, it's, a, it's the Holy Spirit that has to open up our eyes to any truth. You know, we're told to all the time. Um, on top of that, it, it, it will against some Arminian beliefs who believe that you can understand the truth about God just from excited to teach that was their own faith that creation itself so that no man is without it. She said they can believe in God knows God and, and come to that knowledge if they have a desire because remember they don't need the Holy Spirit to enlighten them. They have good within themselves if they have a desire and desire God from the worship creation they can just ask God to come into them and He will come into them and they have the ability on their own. So this is making it clear that no, that can't happen that way at all. It has to be done. You know, this is what we said, so it has to be done. And then come later in the Holy Spirit. That's right. General Revelation doesn't say. Number four, what's the ultimate purpose, according to the confession, of Holy Scripture, and why is it necessary? Um, how should this purpose affect how we read and study Scripture? Well, if you look at... Uh, when it says, therefore, please the Lord, it's under time, the verse of measure to reveal himself, and then after the line about Satan, which is along the first paragraph, uh, it says to commit these things unto writing, which makes the Holy Scripture be most necessary. That's kind of what question four is, is picking up on. So it's like general general revelation is just general and it's not specific, but the word of God is specific revelation and so that it does teach us specifics. That's right. That's right. And if we didn't have it right, we wouldn't know. I think that's kind of what uh, that's saying there. For the more firm establishment and comfort of the church, God gives written revelation. Uh, kind of the second question tucked in there, number four, how should this purpose affect how we read and study scripture? Well, if, if we got God's special revelation in print, we ought to be studying it and sharing it with our neighbors. If we know about these truths of special revelation, we need to read it every day and, and, and tell the people about what we know. Not all people know special revelation. Not all people believe in Christ or know about Scripture. That's one thing I came up with answering that question. Number five, uh, why would the Westminster divine, by the way, divine just means theologian, doubt people who claim to have personal revelation from God? And that question is kind of picked up on that last line of paragraph one. The former ways of God revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. So the that talks about closing the canon of scripture, which goes against most Armenians and Catholicism who don't believe it's closed, and therefore they do seek extra biblical ways, and I don't believe the Bible is enough. I just read on this today. Um, and this is making it clear that now all those things have ceased, God coming directly to the prophets in the Old Testament and speaking directly to them, those old ways have ceased. Right. We have the word, this is all we need, we're not to seek. Other prophets, apostles, such as the Catholic Church believes, you know, the Pope, current Pope's the continuation of apostles because the Bible is not enough. Yeah. They, all those who don't believe the canon of Scripture is closed are always looking for new ways, new miracles to prove the Bible is that the Bible is not sufficient in itself. Yeah, we don't believe in ongoing revelation. Uh, that God has written what He's written in His Word in. Uh, we can know his will in the Bible, but he doesn't continually reveal himself. Uh, scripture is, is, is closed and complete. And so, um, doesn't, isn't that what 
Revelation 22, 18 is kind of talking about? Yeah. I think I have a expression on that coming up later. Let's say I said what Revelation 22 says, don't add to this. Some will, our arguments will argue that that is only that particular book, not the Bible itself. That's how they get out of that. Okay, question uh, paragraph 2 and 3. Under the name of Holy Scripture, where the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, which are the, I'm not going to read through those lists there, but those are the books of the Old Testament and the book of the, books of the New Testament. And then it says, all of this, all of which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. And then paragraph 3. The book is commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of Scripture, and therefore are no authority in the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. So number six, how is Scripture set apart from all other books, and how does this inform our life and our, our doctrine? Yeah, they're breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Um, I like that line. Yes, yeah, it's all of which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. So the Bible differs from other books, and that is inspired. That's Second Timothy three. I think the first sermon I preached here. Um, all Scripture is given by God, is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, proof, correction, and so on and so forth. How does that inform our life and our doctrine? Well, uh, if, it's, if something's breathed out by God, we need to be applying those things to our lives. And of course, our doctrine should come from that inspired work. Yes? Uh, well, a major reason that this is put in here is because the Catholic Church has added on the Apocrypha, the books in between. That's why this is put here. Is specifically go against the Catholic Church and say we do not accept these books that they have added in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously we are too as well. Um, the bonds with none of us, they were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. They have historical error, uh, they contradict scripture, historical, I don't think it's a historical error as well. Um, but the Catholic Church is concerned about that. Uh, they brought those in there because they want to go against Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. We're mad about that, so they added them in. They didn't even originally have the Apocrypha for all those years. They added it much later uh, just to go against the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, that's right. We'll, we'll come and talk about the Apocrypha here in just one second. Uh, number seven. Any other questions about it? One, two, six, four. Number seven. How might we be tempted to add or take away from the scriptures? Uh, how is the warning that you mentioned uh, in Revelation 22, 18 and 19 relevant to this discussion? Well, when it comes to being tempted to add or take away the scripture, I think it's just kind of our sinful nature, but um, the can is closed and God says, don't add, don't take away. What does Revelation 22 say? Did someone have that handy? I had it. <laughs> It's also one in the Old Testament has a similar saying as well. Yes. Revelation 22, if someone has an 80. If I can get my finger working right here. There we go. 22, what was, what was the verse you getting? 18 and 19, I believe. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. And also, just the idea, thing, just the idea of the completion of the canon um, means that God is, is done speaking. And there are a lot of questions we have, right, in life about nature of God, about salvation and so on, but um, we've got to stick to what's written. God told us all we need to know 
And that's, that's sufficient. Was John speaking of Revelation? Or was John speaking of the whole Bible? Well, I think in the immediate context, yeah, it's talking about Revelation. Being so it's not to add anything to the Revelation. Plus, I understand that we should be adding anything yeah. to the rest of the Scripture. That's right. Isn't, isn't there a sense, though, and, and, and I, well, I guess, you know, especially like when you're talking about like the Armenian text, that you're misinterpreting what the Scriptures are? Not that you're necessarily taking away a word or, or, or something from it, but you're, you're still misinterpreting it, and then and then it's taken away from the meaning of what the scriptures say. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> but let's just say, um, I don't know, in Romans 9, where they're talking about election and stuff, what we would say, you know, specifically, especially in context with the rest of the Bible, you know, it means election, period, God Jesus. Yeah. Whereas Armenians would say, oh, that's just talking about whatever, blah, 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 blah. So that's really distorting what the word is. To a certain degree, so you are taking away from the meaning yeah, of what it says. I think distortion, and I think you have to be careful with that. I yeah, think it's kind of. I mean, it says how might we be tempted to add or take away. I think there's a lot of people that have misinterpreted, you know, lots. Yeah. Distorting, and it does well. take away the meaning, not necessarily the words themselves, but the meaning of the meaning. Sure, that's right. I think it's that's good. The vast majority of Christians, of course, even our many, they don't see it wrong the adding of things to scripture adding on over miracles you know as verification that this denomination of this church is a godly church they look for these signs and wonders well i can tell you one thing there are in our group in our age Pentecostals who think that they're an ongoing revelation and we would say, no, God's book is closed. God doesn't reveal himself. Roman Catholics? Uh, well, yeah, they, they're even you know, modern day apostles. And, um, that's right. But God said, no, I'm done. I'm done speaking. I will speak to you through my word. Okay, number eight. The, those who ignore the Holy Scripture are doomed to stumble into ever evening darkness. Well, if we ignore the Holy Scripture, of course, God is God's will for our lives. That's how we find salvation. <coughs> Uh, let's talk about the Apocrypha, number nine. How should Christians view uh, the Apocrypha? The, the Confession mentioned the Apocrypha. Uh, if the Apocrypha books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit, shouldn't we read them at all? I'm going to give you a very, 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 very short overview of the, of the Apocrypha. Uh, in the century before Christ, uh, the Jews be, stopped speaking Hebrew as much and began to speak in Greek. And so a lot of Jewish translators of the Old Testament translated the Bible into Greek because there was a need for that. And when they translated the Bible into Greek, the Old Testament into Greek, um, they lumped in some of those apocryphal books, like um, First and Second Maccabees and Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes and <laughs> Judith. There are 14 or 15 of them, depending on how you buy them up. And long story short, some early Christians um, started lumping those apocryphal books along with the Old Testament. Even longer story short, the Roman Catholic Church uh, puts them in their canon of Scripture. But our best evidence that they're not part of the original canon, the Hebrew canon, um, and the Reformers tried to iron that out at the end of Reformation. And so the Confession takes a very strong stance against the Apocrypha. Anyone ever read parts of the Apocrypha by chance? I was, was going to ask you, where would you find something like that? Like, you know, Catholic like Bible, like all Catholic, Catholic Bibles. Yeah, the, the Apocrypha is, uh, if you pick up a Roman Catholic uh, Bible during the day, if I could refer you, we're a little short on time, if I could refer you to a good article that talks about the Apocrypha, the Reformation Study Bible in the back of the, in the articles talks about the Apocrypha. Really good, short, succinct overview. Also, the uh, well, the ESV Study Bible has a little section on the Apocrypha. Is that thing in there? That's thing in there. Yep. yep. Uh, if they're not inspired by the Holy Spirit, as we believe, then should we read them at all? Well, if you want to read them, you can, but we shouldn't derive any doctrine or theology or practice from the Apocrypha. Okay, last two, uh, last two paragraphs. Point four and point five. 
the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received on this part. Therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. And paragraph 5, our last one for today. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a, a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heaviness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all the Word of God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof, are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself or prove itself to be the Word of God. Yet, or however, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof comes ultimately from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. That's a mouthful right there, <laughs> written in the old English. Okay, so we're 10. Now, upon whose testimony should we trust in Scripture? How does Scripture itself support this conclusion? What we just read. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit. I guess number 11 kind of ties into number 10, so let's look at number, number 11 as well. Uh, what is the what is some of the abundant evidence that the confession talks about, which the Bible gives about itself, testifying that it is the written word of God? Well, look at, look at the second sentence in paragraph five. The heavenliness of the matter. Efficacy of the doctrine, majesty of style, consentable parts, so on and so forth. Number 11 is saying those things about the Bible are evidence that the Bible is the written word of God. So it says the majesty of the style. There's something beautiful about how the Bible is written. Right? It's, it's from God. And that should be evidence for us to take for it to be the word of God. Uh, the consent of all the parts. How the Old Testament meshes with the New Testament. How what Paul says, who's writing uh, in a different time and place in Peter, how that all fit together in Moses and the Old Testament and all these things fit together. Those things like that. Where the scriptures don't agree with this stuff. That's right. The agreement the agree of scripture. Um, the heaviness of the matter. All these things. Those things can give you evidence that the Bible comes from God Himself. Does that, does that make sense? That's what I think the confession is saying there in paragraph 5. Yes, Mark? Well, again, everything is in contradiction with Catholic teaching, which is why it says, or the church, even though the church, but the Catholic church claims that it is the only one that can determine what is canon, what is scripture, how to understand it. Um, and so this is going to completely contrary to what the Roman Catholic church teaches. And that it's solely of God, not of man or of any church that determines the truth of Scripture or the, what to put in the Scripture. Like the Catholic Church thinks they're the ones who have to make the canon. Yeah. Now, the canon, the scriptural, doctrinal books themselves are, little, are fully alone themselves, Scripture, because they're the books that are inspired, only books that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that neither the Catholic Church choose, you know. Or not whatsoever. And that's kind of what the opening line of paragraph 5 is saying. We may be moved, or it may be evidence for us, and induced by the testimony of the church, basically to believe the Bible. So, one reason that you could believe the Bible is true is because the church tells you so. That's, that's okay to, to hold that. Um, but it goes on to qualify that. Verse, look at number 12. Those things, all those things, may help provide evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. But number 12 says, Where does our final and full assurance of God's Word come from? They come from the Holy Spirit. Testify in that last line of verse 
uh, paragraph 5. Our full persuasion and assurance that the Bible is God's Word comes ultimately from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing with us in our hearts. So, again, other evidences are good, but ultimately it's the Holy Spirit. Um, and this, by the way, let me just, let me just look up, talk about this for a second. Notice how it says the inward work of the Holy Spirit, the very last line of paragraph 5, inward work. That's what the Reformed faith is often called the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, which comes from Romans 8 and Galatians 4. Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit. We are, we are children of God, that we belong uh, to God. So the, in, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit is not what the Mormons believe, okay? The, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit is not AD, the Bible is God's Word, so you should believe it. The Holy Spirit doesn't whisper that in your ear, but He awakens you, He assures you through the written Word that this comes from God. This is divine uh, revelation. And the Holy Spirit, by the way, never works apart from God's written Word. Word and Spirit go, go together. That's that last line of saying. Holy Spirit is with the Word in our hearts. And so, if you're not a Christian, you'll never come to believe the Bible is the written Word of God without the Holy Spirit opening your, your eyes. Does that make sense? That's what the confession is saying. That's so 13, maybe we kind of answered 13, didn't we? How am I understanding the Holy Spirit help you respond to someone who says that we do not know God or, or the Bible is words? You like? You like? <laughs> Here's that movie. Here's the movie now. How old you have? All right. How old you have? You check myself. We're on the last question, 13. How might your understanding of the Holy Spirit there, especially talking about what the confession says, help you respond to someone who says we do not know God or that the word of God is God's word? Well, I'm thinking of that passage in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. 2 which can you have that handy? If not, I'll summarize it for it. This basically says, the natural man does not accept the things of God. Basically, you've got to have the Holy Spirit set. Awakening you to enlighten your, your mind and your will to know yes. the truth about God. Okay. That's all I got. Any other questions about the, these opening five paragraphs? I had plans to use the whiteboard and I didn't. Maybe I just want to look like Archie Scroll. <laughs> Which is going to be a chocolate. He's always got the chocolate out there. <laughs> All right, if there's no other questions, I'll pray us out of here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just bless your name for this time together to come um, as a church to think about this confession of faith that we really believe summarizes your word for us. And it's important for us to consider these things and see how they apply to our lives. Uh, Lord, I just pray over each of my brothers and sisters here before me that you would go before them as they go out for the week. Um, whatever it is they do, that you prepare their path, keep them safe, and bring them uh, back to us again. This we pray in Christ's name, by your spirit, amen.